Thank you so much for that uh, nice introduction. And it's really a, quite an honor for me to be introduced by an emerging scholar. Um, it's really um, a pleasure to be here, and I want to thank Laurie and Bengt for, and, and their team members for putting on really a, a spectacular uh, symposium. And it is really a pleasure to see so many um, emerging scholars in the audience, and I look forward to our interaction further uh, during the day. Harvesting water from desert air sounds like magic. It's not when you think about the chemistry that one can use for this application. I will show you today the power of chemistry in solving not just this problem, but many other problems. Um, today I will focus on water, but I think the extension to carbon dioxide capture and conversion will be obvious from just the few uh, discussion that I will have on, um, uh, on these uh, chemistry designs. Well, this is a map of the world, and it shows the water-stressed regions of the world. These areas that are in dark red are basically in trouble. Not too much water is there. So almost one-third of the world lives in regions where I would say they're water-stressed. And then also a lot of the world that is more watered, often they have dirty water or unclean water. So the question is, how can we use chemistry to solve this vexing problem? In 2050, almost 50% of the world will be living in water-stressed regions. So this is a serious problem. Obviously, water is very important to life. And so it is one of the most pressing problems facing planet Earth. Now, I am no stranger to water-stressed regions because I was born and raised in Amman, Jordan. Uh, which is desert climate. There, there I am with a full head of hair. I know some of you don't believe it, but there it is. And uh, around this, uh, this age, um, I had three duties as a young man. One is to study. And you can see I have a book in my hand. Okay, was to study diligently. The second duty was we had a plot of land here that was full of rocks. It's not it's, you can't cultivate it. So my job was to take the rocks from this piece of land and pile it up over here so that we can cultivate it. We can make a garden, plant trees. The third, and this is the most important duty, was that water came every two weeks. And... Uh, only for about five to six hours. And so you have to wake up at dawn. I had to wake up at dawn to make sure that we collect enough water so that we can use it during those two weeks. So the earlier you were, the better. And so that those, whatever I collect is whatever we would use for two weeks. We use for the cows that we lived with, we use for the agriculture, we use for household things. And so you can imagine, I didn't take showers every day. If I took a shower once every week, that was really a, um, a, a luxury. So, fortunately, there is a solution to this problem. And I was, I just want to say, since a lot of students are in the audience, that when I was around this age, around 10 years old, I went into a library that was supposed to be closed, and I sort of leafed through some of the books, and I found what these kinds of drawings, what, I, what later I learned, were molecules. And for some reason, I was captivated by them. I fell in love with, with these drawings that later I learned are really the secret behind life. So, I fell in love with chemistry because of the beauty of molecular drawings. That's the impact of molecular drawings. So, and I still am in love with chemistry because of the beauty of chemical structures. Little did I know that I will spend the rest of my life dealing with chemical structures. Now, the solution to the problem of um, water in the world, 
I think potentially can be solved. There is plenty of water in the air at any one time. This is three sextillion liters of water in the air at any one time. So if I can use chemistry to capture this water, then I can take it and deliver it to regions where it is needed. Needless to say that 160 countries in the world depend on other countries for their water. So it's a, for many parts of the world, it's a national security issue. Now, this is easy to remember. The atmospheric water, or the water that is in the air, is about as much as we have in lakes and rivers on our planet. So there's plenty of water that we can supply those arid regions. So we need to make a material that would be able to capture the water from the atmosphere. And I was interested in uh, chemical structures, and around the time that I became an independent researcher, I looked around, and this is what I found. This is the state of affairs around the time when I became an independent faculty. Okay, let's read this together. One of the continuing scandals in the physical sciences is that it remains in general impossible to predict the structure of even the simplest crystalline solids from a knowledge of their chemical composition. This was the editor of Nature at the time. That's really a scandal. That means we don't know what we're doing. When you're talking about extended structures, materials, we don't know what we're doing. We can't design anything. Roald Hoffman wrote, organic chemists are masterful at exercising control in zero dimension, that's molecules. And one subculture of organic chemists has learned to exercise control in one dimension, that's polymer chemists. These are polymer chemists, the chain builders. But in two or three dimensions, it is a synthetic wasteland. So how are we going to capture water in a material if I have these problems? So my idea was, let's build things from molecular building blocks. That way, perhaps, there might be a way to begin to design, begin to assemble larger structures, and as you will see, structures that encompass space within which one can trap water, or carbon dioxide, or hydrogen. Except there's a problem. The problem is, I call it the crystallization problem. Anytime you try to link building units together through strong bonds, which is what is needed here, to make robust materials, you will make amorphous or ill-defined materials. And so that problem had to be solved before we can address the water problem. Now, all of us are familiar with dry ice and water. Very easy to crystallize because the interactions between the molecules are weak. So it's easy for nucleation and crystallization to take place. Even you can go as far as coordination networks that are made from weak metal neutral linker type. These are also relatively easy to, to crystallize. But what happens if we go to bond strengths that are in this range or this range? What kind of materials could we make? What kind of structures could we make? And can we control them? And the answer is yes. This is what was in the introduction by Kylie. Metal organic frameworks are a result of this attempt to explore this vast structure space. Now, when you use charged linkers and you link them with metals, those are very strong bonds. Those are as strong as a carbon-carbon bond. So, and of course, covalent organic frameworks are linked by very strong covalent bonds. So what, this, what happened here is that we explored this space and succeeded in developing strategies to crystallize these compounds. And this is what we call reticular chemistry. It's the, it's the control of the strong bond. So reticular chemistry, reticular from reticulum, which means net-like, it's the chemistry of linking molecular building blocks by strong bonds to make crystalline extended structures. Strong bonds so that you have a robust material that can be in a power plant 
month after month after month trapping CO2, year after year after year, without having to change the material every time you do a carbon capture. It can stay in the desert year after year, capturing water and delivering water. So we need, so that's the magic of the covalent bond. It's a strong bond to make a robust material crystalline, because I want to know what I'm working with. Crystals is a way to be able to identify what you have on the atomic level, where, how the atoms are connected, and the overall structure is well defined. And therefore, you can go in and modify that material and characterize what you have done with ease. And so, as a result of this kind of thinking, we have made metal organic frameworks that are made from metal oxide units linked by organics. We showed feasibility of this approach of linking the clusters through strong bonds in 95. We showed that they are porous and that they are architecturally robust in 98. And then, as I will show you shortly, we showed that they are ultra, have ultra high porosity in 99. That was metal organic, but you can also do organic. So all what Roald Hoffman said about 2D and 3D being a wasteland is no longer, because in 2005, we showed how you can crystallize organic networks covalently linked in 2D and 3D in 2007. Now, we've heard a lot of biology during this uh, wonderful symposium, and flexibility is very important in biology for function. How do you... And on top of what I will be talking about in terms of trapping things into the pores, we want to also generate flexibility. And the way we do that is through molecular weaving. It's a topic for another discussion, for another time. But molecular weaving is, is a way to take threads of organics that are covalently linked and interlace them with other threads, the red interlacing the blue. Those are mechanically linked, just like my jacket, just like fabric. And therefore, they can be quite flexible. So in principle, I could use the porosity and the functionalizability of these units to create not just a material that traps things or catalyze things, but also a material that's capable of flexibility and dynamics, repeatable flexibility and dynamics, because you are not stressing covalent bonds, but you are moving the threads with respect to each other. And that's a way to have repeatable and resilient dynamics. So that's coughs and molecular weaving are for another time. They have a world on their own. Now I want to talk about moths. The way to make a moth is to take a strut, that's just a diacid, link it up with zinc 2+, plus, and then use organic solvents. These are, this is a magic system, because DMF, when heated to 100 degrees, releases small amounts of base that then deprotonate the acid and causes a reaction with the zinc. And then if you do this very carefully and methodically, you will get a crystal, as shown here. This crystal is porous. The yellow ball indicates the space within which one can trap other molecules and further control matter on the atomic and molecular level. This is a crystal structure. The other thing that is really amazing is that once you discover this, this is done in organic solvent, you can go back and develop a synthesis that is water-based. Almost all important moths have been made in water. The other thing, they're quite recyclable, because after this material, let's say you have it in an automobile for hydrogen or in a power plant for CO2, after the lifetime of the material is done, you can then add very strong acid and break the metal carboxylate bond and generate back the metal ion and the linker. Then you can reassemble it back. So it's a zero waste process and it's been scaled up to multi-ton quantities by BASF uh, in Ludwigshaf in Germany. So the material is quite, excuse me, the material is quite porous. 
This is a gas sorption isotherm performed at 77 Kelvin and low pressure. These are the conditions that you need to make this measurement in order to be able to evaluate how porous the material is. And the porosity is, is determined by the pore volume. In this case, 61% of the crystals is open space. And the surface area that you get from this measurement is 2,900 meters square per gram. That broke all records of porosity that was held by porous carbon for a thousand years. So, this is the power of chemistry. We have taken inorganic and organic and combined them into frameworks within which there is space where one can trap gases, molecules, and transform matter further. Once you know the conditions under which these units form, which we call secondary building units, you can employ any kind of strut, functionalized and expanded. So here, this is functionalized by bromo, amino, and other functionalities. That means you're crafting the interior with whatever functionality might be desirable for whatever function you need. You can also expand the pores so that you can take in progressively larger and larger molecules. This level of control is completely unprecedented in chemistry up until we have reported in MOFs. This kind of chemistry is extendable to every metal in the periodic table and every geometry of uh, SBU. All of these, and this is only a small sample of the units that have been used to make MOFs. These are, this is the inorganic part, and this is the organic part. Simple units such as terephthalate or naphthalic di uh, diacid, or things as long as 11 phenylene units could be used to make MOFs. Um, Tritopic MOFs or tetratopic, okay, things as exotic as this, just for fun, just to show that it can be done. Or things that are octa, dodecatopic actually. Okay, so what I'm trying to say here, if you can think it, you can make it. So, and you can make it as a crystalline material that can be characterized on the atomic molecular level with great precision, just like you do in organic chemistry. But now you're doing it on extended structures that are covalently linked or linked through strong bonds. So this has generated thousands and thousands of materials, and now we have a periodic table of reticular chemistry. And so a student coming into this field can look over here with determine the geometry of the molecule that they want to link. And if this is organic, they can link it with inorganic or two organic molecules to make coughs. Okay. And these are the structures that have been made. These are just the topologies of the structures that have been made. You can imagine that each square here could be a vast area of chemistry because there's infinite number of compositions and combinations that could be used and pore sizes and pore environments. So this has generated, this is really um, a revolution in the way uh, of making uh, extended structures and this has extended chemistry from being restricted to just molecules and polymers to 2D and 3D with the precision that you're used to in molecules. These building units become progressively more and more complex. And you can see there are still some spots that need more work. Okay, so there's plenty of opportunities for the emerging scholars to plug into this, to this area. If your eye can see on the atomic level, you will see things like this where you have pores that have no walls. That was, that's what makes MOFs very special. That's why they have extremely high surface area. They're really scaffolding, and everything you're looking at is an adsorptive site. The metal oxide units, the organic units, both the six-membered rings and the edges of the six-membered rings are all adsorptive sites onto which gases and molecules can bind. 
This material we call MOF 200 has a surface area of 6,300 meters square per gram. A gram of this MOF is not very much more than this, okay? About a coin size. But if I was to unravel that to its atomic level, it will cover an entire football field. And that's the power of chemistry. That's the power of design. That's the power of suspending molecules and pinning them down exactly where you want them, as I have described. The, the MOFs, as I showed you, are architecturally robust because these SBUs anchor the structure. They are thermally stable because they're made from very strong bonds, carbon-carbon bonds, carbon-oxygen bonds, and metal oxide type of bond. All of those bonds are at least 300 kilojoules per mole. They are strong bonds, and many MOFs can be made now as chemically robust. Stable in water, stable in acid, stable in base, and um, under also refluxing conditions of organic solvents and, and, uh, and water. So, we have created a whole new world of extended structures made as crystals, because we have overcome the crystallization challenge. The components of the crystals can be varied nearly at will. This is a crystal structure of MOF5. And the idea that we had very early on, because of their ultra-high porosity, could we take gases that fill very large volume and compact them into the pores? Can we do that? The way that would work is like bees on a honeycomb. Let me show you. This is hydrogen molecules. Usually they repel each other, so hydrogen does not like to come next to each other, so it would fill very large volume. But as you introduce a moth, Hydrogen assembles on the internal surface, on those binding sites, and therefore you're compacting them, just like, as I said, bees on a honeycomb. And so, the applications that we have been interested in is storing hydrogen because it's the cleanest fuel. It burns without any byproduct aside from water. This is something we are still working on. Uh, methane. It's cleaner than petroleum, 50% cleaner than petroleum. Many automobiles use methane. With MOF, you can store three times the amount of methane in a fuel tank compared to a fuel tank that does not have the MOF. Even though the MOF occupies volume, space inside the fuel tank, still it can compact three times the amount of methane. And so your car can travel three times the distance before before you have to refuel. So the methane storage challenge is solved. The carbon dioxide challenge is beginning to be solved on the scientific level, where we can capture carbon dioxide and separate it from other combustion gases, such as water and nitrogen and oxygen. And we have ways of converting carbon dioxide to fuel. If I have time, I will show one slide on this, because I know that some of you were asking a lot of questions about it yesterday. But I want to focus on water. So, what is known out there about capturing water from the atmosphere? You'll hear a lot about that in the press. But you need to look deep to make sure, uh, to think critically about what is being claimed. There's a lot of stuff that is not very scientific. But there are a lot of products on the market that trap water from the atmosphere by the condensation cycle, but they all work on relative humidity greater than 60%. Humidity in the desert, I am very familiar with that, is about 35% during the night to about, it comes sometimes down as low as 5% during the day. So, we need materials that can trap water below 60% relative humidity. There is no such material out there that can do that. Why is that? Because at low humidity, in order to saturate the air with water and get to the dew point, which is the point at which water can be condensed, you have to cool down the air down to almost zero, even below zero degrees C, to saturate enough water in that, in that air so that you can condense it. And this is highly inefficient. This requires a lot of energy. Now, with a moth, 
look what you can do. Potentially, you can trap the water in the moth, concentrate the water in the moth, and therefore now you have high humidity, and then you don't need to cool down to very much to be able to achieve the dew point. And so the moth is our desiccant. And if you can take an air that would have to be cooled to minus 1.5 and degrees C and, and trap the water in the desiccant, now your dew point is 27 degrees C. Now I can easily condense that water. That's what the moth does. So what is that moth? This is the first moth where we discovered this. This is a zirconium moth made from uh, very simple components. And we discovered this quite by accident. We were studying the separation of CO2 from water, which is a very difficult separation to do because water competes with CO2 very effectively for those adsorptive sites. But we were studying the uptake of water to study the behavior of the moth with water, and then we discovered something like, we discovered this red behavior. Okay, the red line is the uptake of water in this material. There are several things that are amazing about this behavior. One is that it takes up water at around relative humidity of 20%. That was quite amazing. The second amazing thing is that it takes it in a sort of a cooperative way that for some reason, as soon as it reaches this point, water gets sucked in, saturates the pores. The third amazing thing about this is that you, to take the water out, all you need is to heat to 45 degrees to take it out. Now, we know all about materials that take up water, like clays and zeolites, and you have to heat them up to 300 degrees C to remove the water because the water is stuck there very tightly. And that's not very efficient. That is not a way to capture water. But this, having to heat at 45 degrees, is not bad. That's actually desert conditions. During the night, you have cool. During the day, you have a little bit of heat that can take the water out. So immediately, my thinking was, that we can deploy this in the desert and make drinking water. Okay, so that, that works in the lab. So now I have to show that this works outside the lab. First, I want to show you that you can take up water in and out of the pores, according to the behavior I showed you before, about 80 times without leaving an imprint on the material. Now, some of you notice here that there is a drop in uptake. I'll show you why that is. That's, that, those are eye seeds that form inside the pores. I will show you that in one second. We do a crystal structure on what's happening in the pores when we introduce water. And water makes beautiful tetrahedral structures and hydrogen bonds to the metal oxide units. And as you add more water, see, cubic seeds form. And these seeds are the key to sucking up more water through hydrogen bonding. And so really you're forming fragments of ice inside the structure at room temperature in the desert. And that's the magic of this material, and that's why you have that cooperative behavior. So let's go outside the lab and, and test whether this works. We designed a system. It's like you can think of it as a jar. And on the, on the lid of the jar, on the interior lid, you have the moth. During the night, you open the lid, water goes into the moth, and during the day, you close the lid, you expose the sunlight, and what happens? The inside heats up, and water comes out and hits the wall of the jar. It condenses because of the temperature difference between the inside and the outside. Very simple principle. But the key is the moth. So here's the moth, and you can see droplets of water forming and increasing in size as the interior of the jar increases, or as the temperature of the interior of the jar increases. Okay, to me, that's, I was, I mean, I was moved. Okay, this was done at relative humidity of around 20%. I was quite moved. Now I can create water where there is no water. Okay, I can't drink this water, I would have to lick it, because it's, we only use two grams of moth. So now we need to show that this works on larger scale. So we took one kilogram of that moth, and 
uh, we designed the, a larger system where you have a box within a box. The interior box is for the moth, the outside box is really your condenser. It works in exactly the same way I described before. At night, the outside box is open, lets air in, water saturates the pores, during the day you close it, sunlight heats the interior and water comes out and condenses on the wall. You could potentially con uh, collect water. This is what the box looks like, it's very simple polyurethane uh, uh, box within a box. And the students took this to Arizona, to Scottsdale, Arizona. And these uh, three students, Farhad, Marcus, and Eugene, took one kilogram, drove an SUV all the way to Scottsdale, Arizona from, from Berkeley. And you can see the result of the experiment. You have droplets that are now running and then forming puddles and they collected that water. So the result is that they can collect, based on the weather, 0.2 to 0.3 liters of water per kilo of moth. That's about this much water for each kilo of moth. Okay, that's basically what they collected. That is without any energy input aside from sunlight. That's a passive system that only works on sunlight. So, Eugene volunteered to drink the water. I didn't recommend this, but he sent me this video. I was quite amazed that he did it. There's supposed to be voice here, but... Okay. Nice. Eugene is alive and well. He, <laughs> he graduated with a PhD. Obviously, we tested the water. The water has absolutely no detectable amounts of metal or organic or any other contaminant. Remember, the moth is really its own filter. The water is evaporating. There are several purification steps that are happening already. And the moth is selective towards water. So, back to the power of chemistry. That was a zirconium moth, and zirconium is $150 a kilo. So if we want to use this on a global scale, we need to go to a metal that is quite cheap. So reticular chemistry is now at work. You can make an aluminum compound, we call it moth 303 that works even better than the zirconium compound. Aluminum is dirt cheap. Okay, so this has a capacity at relative humidity of 25%, has a capacity of even higher, 0.33 liter of water per kilo of moth. And this synthesis is done in water. So we took MOF-303 to the desert again, but this is now the Mojave Desert. So the students rented, I don't know, a, a god-awful place in the desert, in the middle of nowhere. And this is the test. So this is the amount of water that they are collecting during the day and night. But I want you to focus on the relative humidity. During the day, the humidity is high. Excuse me, during the night, humidity is high. During the day, it's extremely low. You can see it goes down to almost 7%, 5%. But still, we are collecting water. And so I told him not to come back without a video of this water collection. You can see now, based on one kilo, these are droplets of water and they are being collected. So from this experiment, we can collect one liter of water per kilo of moth per day. Okay, so we can create water where there is no water at these humidity levels, 5 to 35 relative humidity. So we've gone from the laboratory scale 0.002 liter to the first prototype 0.2 liter to the second device 1 liter and now for real application to society you look at the kinetics of how fast because the moth is so open as i mentioned before the kinetics of uptake and release is so fast that now if i can hook the device up to a solar panel i can do many cycles in and out and so Eugene, the guy that drank the water, now works for Water Harvesting Incorporated, and they are releasing, um, in October 2019, a device that's as large as a microwave oven 
that produces eight liters per day, a device that is as large as a small refrigerator that will produce 260 liters per day. If you maximize the exposure of the granule of moth to the air, chemistry works beautifully and you can deliver on the maximum capability of the moth. And shortly thereafter, we will release this device, 22,500 liters per day. So what have we done? We have harvested water from air in desert climate, but we've done more. We've made water mobile. Water can go wherever you go. It's like taking the wired phone and making a wireless phone. So water is mobile. It's personalized. It's your own water, your own air, your own water. And it's ultra pure. How many of us, when we drink water, we don't know what's in it? This is ultra pure water. Okay, in the last minute or so, I want to, just for the interest of the students who ask a lot of questions about CO2, you can use reticular chemistry to attach covalently primary amines on the anterior and capture CO2 to make carbamate. And this is the test that shows that, in fact, the system works. Basically, you expose the moth to a mixture of gases, including water and CO2. This is a very difficult separation. And the idea is to capture the CO2 and release out nitrogen and harmless water. Okay? And so, this is the experiment. For the material that doesn't have water, this is the amount of time where the CO2 is held into the pores, and then as the pores saturate, CO2 breaks through. So therefore, a breakthrough experiment. But the real test is that when I introduce water, look what happens. The same behavior. Water is not affecting the uptake of CO2. Okay, this is the first time that someone can demonstrate that you have a solid taking up CO2 selectively, separating it from water. And so the scientific challenge of capturing CO2 is being solved in this experiment. We can, do, we can also convert CO2 to a fuel, to methanol. Here's a copper nanoparticle trapped inside a nanocrystal of moth. So the moth now is a well-defined enclosure that allows CO2 to pass through the pores and be converted to methanol. And you can see the performance of this material far exceeds the state of the art. This is the copper inside the moth, and this is the productivity of this system. Again, the conversion of CO2 to methanol is beginning to be solved. The idea of making perhaps a moth that separates CO2 and converts it into a fuel is not very far from reality. We know that the components work. We need to put them together. Okay, in the final bit, because there are a lot of biologists here, I want to talk about the next step for this chemistry. And the next step has to do with heterogeneity. Chemists shy from heterogeneity because every time we have a heterogeneous system, we don't know how to characterize it, it's a mess. But moths have solved that problem. Now I can use the order of moth and superimpose heterogeneity on it covalently. Let me show you what I mean. Here is a moth unto which I have attached many different functionalities covalently. So now I have heterogenized the pores, just like you would, just like you have in an active site of an enzyme. Quite a heterogeneous environment of functionalities. This is not really, if you would allow me to make this analogy, this is not very different than DNA in concept. The backbone of DNA is nothing but a repeat, boring repeat of sugar polyphosphate backbone. Sorry, banked. <laughs> but unto which you have nucleotides that are covalently bound, and their spatial arrangement makes, it, makes a difference. And so the spatial arrangements of these functionalities are also a sequence of information. And so we find that these materials are very powerful at selecting CO2. And it really introduces this idea of sequence-dependent structures. And so this system is not a mess.
because the heterogeneity is superimposed on a highly ordered system. We know how far they are from each other. We know we can vary the ratio. We know what they are. And for the biologists here, this is what we can do with that kind of system. We can take an enzyme like TEV protease and approximate or, or look at the active site and then take those functionalities and covalently bind them into the framework. And then look at whether this MOF behaves like the enzyme. This enzyme can cleave this amide bond and only this amide bond, and this is the only thing that can do this. But now this MOF with this heterogeneity can do exactly the same thing, but now under much different reaction conditions, much wider reaction conditions. So the potential is great for using MOFs, coughs, and weaving. Now you can see where I'm going with all of this to introduce heterogeneity covalently, bind it onto the backbone, and then carry out things that are as selective as they would be in a biological system. Well, that's the end of my talk. I want to acknowledge the funding and acknowledge my wonderful group members in addition to those that I've already acknowledged in the slides. And thank you very much for the invitation and for your attention. <laughs>